What is it we really want to do here? That's a kind of important distinction. It's all very well. We can stand up a load of sprints. We can get everybody on Jira if you insist. What does that actually change in terms of the way you do business, the way you interact with your customer, the happier the people who work on your products and services are, and fundamentally the quality of said products and services? Mr. Dave Bishop, welcome to Warrington. Thanks, Jack. Pleasure to be here. Sunny day, sun is shining. Have you been here before? I, think I have say. been here before, but not not for a number of years, Jack. So it's uh, it's, it's good to be back. It's good good to be anywhere at the moment. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Travel from Manchester. Yep, up to day on the train. Everything fairly seamless, so no complaints. Oh, nice one. So. Apart from being, this is where I rip off your LinkedIn profile, apart from being a certified <laughs> safe five program consultant, scrum master, and an independent management consultant, you're driven, you're dynamic, and you're a flexible, senior, lean, agile transformation professional with a strong record of supporting senior managers, executives, and directors. Apart from all that... <laughs> who is dave bishop i mean jack i have to apologize for that but i'm trying to hit as much of the metadata when <laughs> someone's searching for cvs on job servers as i oh, can <laughs> i think you've ticked every box there so i mean jack i think me and you share a lot in common you know we're, we're probably more delivery focused than most coaches would be you know it's odd that i sit so close to the safe banner uh, in terms of you know i think certainly across hardware firmware and software i'm seen as one of the uk if not europe's experts in that space but I'm not really a huge safe guy. So, you know, it's an interesting tool to be used. It tends to be bought by businesses very much, but it's not to say it's not without its faults. Yeah. And I think, you know, a lot of the light and heat you see, especially on platforms like LinkedIn, can be very anti-safe. And that's mm. not always without good reason. You know, I think there is maybe 50% of the chatter, people who don't really have the experience to comment. And, you know, you probably know me well enough, Jack, by now to say, if I, if I don't understand something, I'm not going to talk about it very much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get that. But I think there is a lot of people who have had negative experiences. And that's probably something I think me and you will want to drill in a bit, you know, as the conversation kind of evolves in terms of, well, you know, what are the problems and what are the pe parts people are seeing that they don't like? Because I think there are certainly probably three to five things that I've seen when I've gone and done remediation work or something else in terms of, well, why isn't that working? Or, yeah. or why is it turning people off? And I think that's really, really important to start pulling out those threads. So before we go into that yeah, yeah, sort sure. of uh, deep dive, how did you, what's the journey, that the sort of one minute, one to two minute journey of how you ended up doing, doing what all of I do. this? I mean, Jack, probably like for a lot of us, a bit of a happy accident, really. I mean, for... The last 20 years, you know, I was probably doing things most people would have said were suitably strange with my teams, you know, so I was having my morning musters or huddles, we had a big murder board over what the things to worry about were, we were all collaborating much more than a lot of the teams and the businesses that I tended to work and, you know, I was oftentimes getting in trouble with MDs and chief execs and coups and everything else for this. And was this as a developer or as you, have you always been in project? I've like, always been a kind of project and program yeah. guy. So it's not just today nobody would thank me for my code, Jack. I think yeah, even yeah. in the old days, nobody would have particularly <laughs> thanked me for my, my coding. Fair enough. So it was kind of laid into this kind of, you know, more official body of knowledge. So it was probably about maybe 10 years ago I started reading about this. And it was predominantly about cost reduction, which is something yeah, yeah. I think we'll look at later uh, because that was kind of what I was predominantly tasked with at that time. Uh, and to kind of see, actually, this isn't a million miles away from what I'm doing at the minute. And yeah. it was, you know, a kind of very, very gentle introduction. Again, my first experience with Scrum, I wouldn't say was great. You know, I went up to this big uh, floor and everybody's about. They've got the team boards, everything. Some girls sitting there with bunnies at a desk. I'm thinking, what the hell is going on here? Um, and just kind of building out, you know, getting that real experience, learning what the difference is in terms of kind of what I seem to have stumbled on and what the more official theory was. And that's been a kind of interesting journey in itself as well, Jack, because mm. I think at the start, I almost became kind of, I think, like a lot of people knew to our way. It's how strictly can we run to these rules? Yeah, yeah. How agile are we? And is this ticking all the boxes? The agile police. Yeah. And now when I kind of work with teams, I'm actually much more like I was early days mm. when it's much more, how are they working at the minute? What might help? What's not going to confuse them? What can we encourage? What do they already know? And yeah. I think that's the bit a lot of coaches forget. These people are way closer to the work than, especially interims like me and you will ever get 
let's give them the respect to listen to them, one, but also they probably know a lot of stuff that we don't know and never would know. More often than not, they're the cleverest people in the room <laughs> and we should, you know, we should treat them as that. Right. Absolutely. We're on their turf, we're in their house. Absolutely. Um, so if you were to, if you were an elevator pitch, if you like, what does agile mean to you? What does agility mean to you? This is an interesting one, Jack, and this was one of the questions me and you spoke about before that I really started to reflect on in terms of, you know, I think the initial conversation we were having was around, uh, you know, what could businesses focus on rather than Agile? Mm. Uh, so actually, what does Agile mean to me? Probably not a lot. Yeah. yeah. When I go and work with my teams, these days, it's more about educating the senior managers, especially. The goal should never be about being Agile. Yeah. The goal for us, especially in the context that we work at the minute, yeah. is delivering world-class software and systems. That's it. If Agile helps, buy it by the bucket load. Yeah, if it yeah. doesn't, forget about it. Uh, so I think it's funny in terms of, especially with the way we are engaged by clients because they want to buy it. Go and get me an Agile. My friend's got one. I, I want yeah, yeah. Okay, great. But what is it we really want to do here? Uh, so I think that's a kind of important distinction that a lot of clients aren't necessarily really aware of in terms of, it's all very well. We can stand up a load of sprints. We can get everybody in Jira if you insist. What does that actually change in terms of the way you do business, the way you interact with your customer, the happier the people who work on your products and services are, and fundamentally the quality of said products yeah. and services? It's interesting. And where do you think, again, in your, we've all got opinions, right? <laughs> where do you think organizations, from your experience, go wrong? And what are the reasons behind that? Yeah, so I think one of the reasons is it's, it's unclear why they want to do it. Mm. Yeah, so I think that there's a lot of buzz. Uh, the market's obviously really, really, really keen to sell at the minute. And, yeah. and the market's hot, Jack. Me and you recognize that, yeah? Wouldn't be uh, doing this otherwise. Yeah, well, <laughs> like, yeah, of course. Here's the reality. Uh, yeah, of, of course. We're all, uh, you know. And, you know, Jack, I, I mean, just before we deep dive into this, uh, you know, I love the stuff you do on LinkedIn. I know me and you don't always agree. I know I don't always know when you're joking or not. <laughs> and neither do I. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's really, really good to see somebody in that space. I mean, I'm much more of a, I wouldn't say a dark horse or a, a lone wolf or anything, but, you know, I, I just kind of, you know, get on, get enough a few couple of arguments and everything else. Yeah, but, yeah. Me and you are, uh, you know, I think more or less aligned in terms of what's important. So when do things start to struggle? Again, I think the industry doesn't do itself any favors with so many certifications. And I'm not necessarily talking org ink arguments or DA or say for anything else. Yeah, I think it's just this idea that you can go and sheep dip 200 people and all of a sudden all your problems have gone away. You yeah. know, even the role title of Scrum Master, I have arguments with people all the time. Let's call them Scrum novices when they come off a two-day course, okay? Because that's all they are, yeah? yeah. It's not a master as in a master-slave relationship. It's a master in terms of they're a master of their craft. Yeah, yeah. Well, nobody's a master of their craft. I mean, I don't think I'm a master of my craft in terms of agile. New, I'm learning new things all the yeah, time, and I'm disproving my own uh, misassumptions. So I think the training industry is a, a real, real issue, and I think the way it's used by businesses is a real, real issue. I think that kind of bleeds in probably to point two, which is you know probably something me and you see more than most people. Coaching is the most misunderstood mm. tool in any business's toolbox. Yeah. So you either see it, they buy a bunch of training, but there's no support coaching, or there's no one for people to rub up against about application. So then you see this whole thing. Okay, we're doing a two-week sprint, but it takes us two weeks to get into test. And it, it's stuff that me and you could spend five minutes with a team and identify, okay, what are the bottlenecks? Let's remove them. Let's thin it out. Let's lean your process. Let's yeah. get on with it. Because that's absence, you kind of go from, we know textbook can't fit real world because it doesn't fit real world in yeah, any yeah. other situation. So what would make us special? And it's then who's going to help businesses translate that between fundamentally what you're trying to do, how you do at the minute, how your teams are working at the moment. So I think that misunderstanding about the relationship between training and coaching and the idea that training is almost a silver bullet that will solve everybody's problems is it, and does that reflect with your experiences yeah, too? Yeah, and I always like to, because I'm not um, a certified trainer or anything like that, so I hope you take this with the intent that it's made. How do you balance that as someone who 
potentially does do some training with you know with what you I always find that an interesting thing yeah uh, so it, it is an interesting one and uh, you know I am probably a slight false prophet in terms of our message here Jack in terms of you know a big part of my business is training I've got some great clients that I like to work with uh, on training which is fantastic and I've you know all yeah, power yeah. to you I just genuinely find it interesting of I don't know how I would balance to do it, it it's two. difficult I mean you know I, I tend to break the fourth wall a lot in my training courses so there's a lot of this is what this is telling and this is why I fundamentally yeah, disagree yeah. with it, but by the way this is what you will need to parrot yeah. in said exam i always say when i do workshops or training this is scrum utopia <laughs> this is where you know unicorns shit out post-its and everything's perfect when you go back in the office tomorrow it may work like this and you i think as the trainer and you you know agree or disagree you have to let them know when you're balancing that tightrope of i'm in utopia and then now I'm, this is how it may feel when you go back somewhere. Absolutely. I mean, probably the most said quote by me in training courses, Jack, would be, you know, I need to teach you the rules for you to go and break the rules. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But we need a firm foundation first. So I think training can be useful, but it's way, way more useful with coaching. And actually, I mean, again, I do like money. You know, training can be a great opportunity to sell into potential clients as well. Yeah, yeah. It's because, normally the gateway, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. You know, so there's that element for it. You know, I don't tend to do so much these days, pure play. Two days with Dave Bish, go away and do your search. I do do it if anybody wants to buy it, yeah, feel yeah. free. Link in the comments. Uh, it's still <laughs> very good, very high quality. Um, and, and I think what I like to do, Jack, as well is, you know, even if it's other people's materials, like some of the scaled agile stuff, you know, I, I customize it a lot. So, you know, they talk about a lot of the ideas. Yeah. I think stolen from Cotter's latest book, um, Accelerate, in terms, you know, the industrial revolutions and changes and when does tech affect. So, you know, what I tend to do is, you know, take real examples, you know, so you, there's great stuff in terms of the context. Me and you are working with a few of our clients at the moment mm. in terms of, you know, the kill chain. So, yeah, know, yeah. so guess what, guys? The shift has happened. Do any of the clients we work with really, really understand that? I don't think so. So that's a great way to start reinforcing those messages. Yeah. Get that burning platform going. Start getting the excitement. You know, we know there are other people who can do stuff maybe faster than we can. And why does SAFE get such a bad rep in your opinion? Because I see it and I just, it's like, it's like an episode of Hollyoaks sometimes or a poor soap opera that nobody asks for. But <laughs> I think I always wonder, and, and, and I suppose it's not just SAFE, but certifications. I don't really see anyone going hard at, say, Prince 2, which mm -hmm. has arguably, arguably been around for a lot longer and puts people in the same precarious yeah. position. So what do you think is like... What triggers people with safe? I think the first trigger is Jack seeing something not work right. So actually, if you think about it from a scale perspective, safe comes in for a lot of criticism, some deserved, by the way. Mm. It's the same at Scrum at the team level, yeah? yeah, you, yeah. The more whinges you hear about Agile, it tends to be the stuff people will encounter the mm. most. Um, actually, when I think about why these things don't work or deliver or, or turn things off, I think it's the same either at team level or at scale mm. level. It tends to be very, very by-the-book implementations. Yeah tends to be very, very little consultancy or customization. You know, I'm not saying ignore things. Yes, yeah. the rules will exist for a reason, but not all rules are going to be useful in every single context. No. Um, I also think it's it's become one of these things, you know, I was speaking to Brian Finistas from uh, Defense Unicorns probably a few months ago. And it's like that big picture of safe, Jack. It seems, it's like catnip for a chief exec or a C-suite. They, they love looking at it. They can kind of sort of see how their organization already is in that schema. Mm -hmm. and, it, and that's dangerous because the minute they see that, they want it. And I think a lot of them want it because they think they don't have to change anything. Yeah. You know, they automatically start mapping however they're currently organized against that. And actually, that's when you would expect your SPC resource, your SPCTs to actually be given challenge. Yeah. Here's the problem, Jack. In 70% of cases, that challenge does not come. Mm. So I don't know if that's because it's a low barrier to entry or if people don't have the right real world experience or if people would rather just preach from a book rather than actually do what a consultant should be nice. doing. But that, that that's a challenge, I think, that we're going to see more because I don't know how you feel about this, Jack. For me, it's still, you know, everybody's like, everybody's going agile. It's like, this still feels like early S-curve adoption to me. You know, it's not everywhere. Yeah, I think in the context that we're working in, which is a bit mysterious for everyone watching, <laughs> but there's a reason behind that. It's always been secret. It's yeah. always been, we're not going to show them. We're not going to show you. We know we need to keep things behind the curtain. We're never, you know, and 
so to then automatically think that these organizations can be agile mm -hmm. when they've been working in the shadows for so long you know that's going to take time and it might not, they may have been these these companies a lot of them have been delivering for yeah. a long time yeah hundreds so of years. agile might be a tiny some of the ideas within agility might be one small cog of it yeah um, agree. so there is a there is a long way to go in some in some context i think just to just to understand it um previously one of the problems you said organizations not understanding why is, is there anything else where you think organizations um struggle in terms of getting right. the benefits from it. I mean, I, I think there is exactly that point you almost just made there, Jack, in terms of, you know, 100 years of successful business delivery, shareholders in many cases involved. Yeah. Do you, If you were running those businesses, and there's probably good reasons guys like me and you don't run them, Yeah, yeah. would you want to rock the boat to the extent that you would need to, to fundamentally, and I think it's a brave, brave chief exec with shareholders to answer to every 12 months yeah. who's going to say, do you know what? I'm all, they do exist. Look at the work Mick Kirsten did at Porsche. That was a brave, brave decision and a brave, brave buy-in from the very top. Mm. I think it's suitably rare because most people... And guess what? Here's the other thing. A lot of the agile work that me and you are involved in, remediations, and anything else, hasn't always delivered the wonderful things everybody thought it would. Mm. In fact, many times, it's actually forced businesses to go backwards. So there is that kind of degree, I think, where as an industry, we have to almost be like... You know, what are we delivering here? How are we showing value? How are we showing stakeholder value? And, and how are we fundamentally improving things? And mm -hmm. I think that gets forgot. You know, it's almost like this transformation by checklist. Well, you know, we've stood up 12 yeah, scrums yeah. and they're all on their JIRA and we know they have their retros. So how much more agile do you need us to... I mean, what does that tell you? It tells you nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's like we can... The old project management iron triangle shown in courses all around the world. <laughs> but it's sort of saying, well, some of these might be successful projects and Agile might not save them. But I also am a massive fan of starting small. Don't have a £50 million change budget if you if you haven't recognized that you might not need to change that much. So you change, are you changing for change's sake? Should we just run one pilot team, scrum team, Kanban team, make it up? I don't really care. To see what we to see what benefits we can get out of some of this stuff, if you're fundamentally bringing in outsourced help, which is ironic because that's what we are to build your product, you're going to be addicted to that supply. Like, you, you, who are you reliant on to build the product? Mm -hmm. Is Company X really building Company X's product, or is it being outsourced somewhere else? And yeah. if you can't tackle that, Agile is probably not going to do that much for you. No, I, I agree. It's, it's it's fundamentally misunderstood as a, you know, I think probably people like me and yourself, Jack, look at this as if, you know, it's a tool in a toolkit. Yeah. Uh, it isn't a means to an end. It isn't an end state of being. It never yeah, stops. Yeah. There's there's the other issue with Agile Chance. When's it done? Yeah. When's anything done? Yeah. It's never really done. You know, you're telling me at one point a team is going to get to the point there's nothing left to continuously Once do. everyone's trained, mate, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> um but it's true, isn't it? You can't you can't tick box it. And I think I always say I'm here to sh to show you the differences. You can make up your own mind. Yeah, like absolutely. I'm not. You're you know you've asked me to come here, folks. If you're not going to listen to me, that's that's okay. Yeah. You know, but you came to me, <laughs> like. But I'm not going to force it down down your throat. And that's the interesting side when you were talking about coaching before. Or oh, person X needs coaching. You need to go and do that. Does person X, does he know, he or she know that? I can't yeah. just impose myself on them. You know, people have the right to to be coached, mentored, whatever you want to call it, by people who click. Yeah. I can't, They might. we might not get along, we can't. And then they might be pushed further back because they've been turned off by the offering where someone else could be saying exactly the same thing as you and I in a bit in a bit, in, a, in a kinder way yeah, or yeah, a less direct way. And that, that approach might suit them. So you can't just match people up with, with coaches and consultants and expect it's, them well, to jump. Even internally, Joe and clients, you know, it's like the madness of buddy schemes. Yeah. Okay, great. But can we have them at least they're real buddies or people who might get on? You know, yeah, you yeah. see this kind of stuff all it always makes me laugh when a team will disappear into the dark and, and come back with a oh look, Coach Dave, we've done a team chart and you're kind of reading it and then it makes you sad because it's basically people agreeing to just treat people like the human being. Yeah. It's like, do we really need to document? Is it really this bad? Yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna, yeah. <laughs> then we're going to treat each other like, you know, like you say, like humans. 
Um, but that's not to say they're not useful. No, it's just it's just digging. Not. It's just digging a bit deeper. Yeah. You know, yeah. not being, not turning up to work and being a knob should just be a given. You know. Yeah. We shouldn't have to hold people, hold people up to that too much. Um, so if you if you were in the agile kitchen and you had three ingredients, what would organisations or teams need to get the benefits of agile or agility? Right. I'll I'll, I'll probably hit one of your trigger. Trigger warning points here, <laughs> Mr. Hughes. Uh, the first one, dedicated teams. Yeah, yeah. yeah? Uh, guess what, businesses? If you are going to hire and engage people like myself and Jack and give us people who will be doing stuff off the side of the desk, I can guarantee you, and in fact, I may save you thousands of pounds with this piece of advice, those people aren't going to get very much done because it should be no surprise to anybody with very, very limited resource that is not um, dedicated to the task in hand. doesn't matter what wrapper you want to put across it, a Kanban team, although that might be vaguely more it, it successful than a Scrum team in said instance. Mm. If you don't have dedicated resource working on the task, you're going to get very, very little from a I agile agree. transformation. There's no point having someone 0.75 FTE and then... Yeah. Well, they get to come to the events and yeah. never do any work. Oh, great. It's probably interesting meetings to an extent. but also That's why these frameworks get a bad rap. Yeah, of course. Right. If, you're, no. if you're expecting people to do the Scrum events in this example with two teams and all of the other nonsense they have to do, then they're going to go to the new thing. They're going to blame the new thing, aren't yeah. they? Sorry, go on. No, no, no. But I mean, it's an important point to kind of explore for us, Jack, because I think it, it kind of ties into the the next point. Um, and, and here's a problem for UK PLC, by the way. Why is it that a lot of businesses, and I say a lot because I think it's more common than not, Mm. tend to use project and program world and i know with agile you could argue well it's not really project and program world. Well, let's yeah, call yeah. it product world now okay let's let's be modern and, and pretend for a moment why is it so much of this is used as dumping grounds for people who are either a pain for their bau line managers or not seen as key and i've wrestled with this several times jack in terms of, i think it boils down to two or three things one I understand wholeheartedly why you would want to keep the A team working on the parts of the business that make you money. Th yeah. That makes absolute sense to me. Yeah, any new innovation, product, whatever it might be, is inherently risky. Yeah. But also, you know, you're kind of making a trade off there that I don't think businesses are realizing they're making in terms of if you don't have at least some of the A team on said activities, you're going to really struggle. By the way, that is not me criticizing all project and program professionals. This is an organizational issue I think a lot of people rub rub into um, and against. Uh, so, you know, again, why would that be? I can't really nail it down absolutely. But I think there definitely has to be a, a reassessment about the, the type of people, the type of skills oftentimes, Jack. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you think about, you could argue in part of our roles as change agents or ways of working or whatever else you want to term as, you know, we are there to upskill people. And I think we both do a fairly good job at that. Yeah. But, you know, what could organizations have maybe done differently without us to, to kind of get to those kind of stages? I mean, in terms of a third thing, why things, it, it, it's probably the kind of, and, and this is the Billy basis. These these kind of things I'm pointing out here are making me quite sad thinking about them. It's you know, nobody knowing what they're doing. Mm. You know, not just a clear vision or a, a postcard or a, like fancy video. Yeah. Um, although if you want a great product vision, uh, Rolls Royce, Orpheus, it's, that's the best. It's got a dragon in it. It's incredible. Go on YouTube. I saw that, yeah. Watch it. It is absolutely brilliant. Um, but, you know, how often is it you'll go in and work with a new team and ask people what you're working on? Maybe you'll get a couple of lines. What are you doing here? Yeah. Uh, we had, it's funny. We, uh, I'm not going to call it PI planning because it's not. It's big. It's, <laughs> it's two days of people collaborating soon, and someone asked me, "Oh, you know, we've got this business context piece. Have you got a template for it?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you what the teams want to know. They want to know where we are on this specific program. They want to know what's coming up in the next three months." They want to know why it's important. Why should they be bought in? And they probably want a bit of a pat on the back. Yeah. Like there's, there is no template to that. You can come with all of, you can come with 10 decks that's going to take two hours to go through. Fundamentally, 
people want to know those four to five different things and it's actually stultifying jack in this day and age people don't know we have every means of communication big businesses that mean you work with yeah. they have every flavor uh, podcasts videos intranets extranets whatever you want to call it but yeah still people don't know what people don't know it's like what wow mm. how can they not know do you think it's because they overcomplicate, over engineer the message? I think people love complicating things. Mm. So, and, and I also think there's also a degree of obfuscation. It's not just dealing with the type of clients me and you often work with. Yeah. I think a lot of businesses still seem to thrive on some very, let's call them legacy behaviors. I know something you don't know, and yeah. I'm not going to tell you. I've never really understood that mindset. Mm. You know, even before I, I was agile, I never really understood why people acted like that. Yeah. Um, but there still is, you know, we can do the old mushroom quote, whatever else you want. That still seems to be a very, very prevalent management style in the UK in 2022. Yeah. How sustainable that is for anybody, I actually don't know at this point. I think it will change with the personalities coming through and the way, just the way people are now. I think that will soon get phased out. But those behaviors are still going to be, if you're taking over someone who's been somewhere for 20 years, your, your by osmosis, you're going to pick up on some of those characteristics. Um, moving outside of the agile bubble for a second, is there, are there any things that pe you think people would benefit from focusing on outside of the the agile bubble? Yeah, it, it probably ties into what we said right at the beginning, Jack, and, and part of that conversation. You mm. know, focus on what's important: your customer and your product. Yeah. You know, if you can keep your customers as happy as they can be. And you can deliver real, real world-class products. Almost every other organizational constraint or anything else will disappear. Um, so that would be it. Think about, you, you know, it's, it's, it's the thing, you know, the start with why. How do anybody ask themselves that? You know, why? We want to be added. No, that's not a why. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. running a five whys with a team the first time. And you get to the fifth one. And what's the reason? Oh, it's Barry in HR. No, no, it's not Barry in HR. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything that, you draw inspiration from that people would be surprised that oh that, I've, i haven't heard of that before because it's not in that agile space sphere. i mean I, I love mma okay yeah, yeah you know and i think that you know there's there's real application you know it, for guys like me and you jack i think it's really interesting we've probably seen enough stuff out in the big bad world mm. to kind of remind us of the people who really apply this so yeah, when you yeah. think about it you know military contexts yeah you you will see it on the ground if not you know, in the leadership and the yeah, gods, yeah. yeah. Uh, firemen, I think, is an absolute classic example. Everybody yeah. can do everybody's job. Especially everybody. the retained ones who <laughs> just form in five and go. minutes. And, or the R RNLI or you know, so anything it's, like that. It's almost like that, a build on, you know, you know how a fireman's going to behave because you, you, they're drilled. You know yeah, how, yeah. if you put a Marine in the field, I know what he's going to behave yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, I know what he's going to do. Um, so MMA, I think, is a good one because it's a real proving ground in terms of what works and what doesn't. You know, you saw pretty much in the old kind of, Royce Gracie days, you know, what didn't work? You know, people were turning up and, you know, being absolutely annihilated by jiu-jitsu. It actually turns out, I think, for most people or body types, the most effective methods of combat are a combination of probably some form of Brazilian jiu-jitsu or wrestling uh, and, and Thai boxing, mm -hmm. in, in, in effect. So I, I like seeing that. I like seeing anywhere where people are constantly kind of ruling in and ruling out and just you know it's almost the bruce lee take what's yeah, useful yeah. discard what doesn't you know add your own flavor and that's always an interesting one i think for the start of coaching air uh, because most people actually do this in their day-to-day -day lives mm. it doesn't matter if they're involved in physical activity but you know it's part of this kind of you know quest for mastery or whatever most people start to apply at least those basic lessons of well i tried that and it didn't work so i tried something else um, and then that can sometimes be a good thing just to explore in terms of, okay, so this kind of comes naturally to you because it's just what you, you do. Mm. And I think it's weird because when you look at you, I'm obsessed by my niece. I love my niece. Hey, we Bella. But that girl's just fascinating to watch, Jack. Mm. You know, she's not, I mean, one, she's happy nearly all the time, which I think we can all learn something from, you know, how many times do you get finished on a Friday? It's just like, get me to the pub as quick as possible yeah, and yeah. I need about nine pints. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably less common now with married men and everything else. Gluten-free beer. <laughs> if anyone wants to sponsor the next video. <laughs> but, you know, just watching a kid in the moment, you know, yeah. if they fall over, it doesn't, you know, it's just all pure like, joy. There's no fear of making a mistake. There's there's no real fear about getting hurt. Uh, I, I just think there's something wonderful there in terms of attitude. And I think that's the one thing I almost wrestle with myself mm. in terms of, 
well, who am I to say? Yeah. Uh, and, and, it, and it's like, what, how am I drinking my own bath? What, what am I changing? You know, how many times do you actually change your assumptions? Yeah, and I yeah. think that's an interesting one because, you know, probably at this stage of my career, Jack, now I've probably changed my mind on more or less everything at least 20 times now. So yeah? I was just about to say, is there anything <laughs> you've changed your mind about recently that you never thought you would? Yeah. I mean, you know, all, I mean, probably the biggest one for me, Jack, was, was pandemic driven. Mm. So, you know, I had always been fairly vociferous with clients, unless you can give me some face-to-face -face time with these boys and girls in the same room. Yeah. And if you can't do the same room, the same building is going to be my trade-off. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to work with you. Uh, that obviously became a difficult sales message yeah, yeah. Uh, in March a couple of years ago, yeah? Mm. Uh, and actually, that surprised me. It surprised me how well people could work remotely. It surprised me how well people could collaborate mm. remotely. It surprised me actually how adaptable people fundamentally were. Mm. So that that was probably a big assumption check for me in terms of maybe you don't always know the best. Having said that, I think I am now coming out the other end of that and now things are opening up thankfully again. I'm I'm still got a strong preference, Jack. For I mean, how do you find it? Do you still have a strong preference for face to face with your teams and any of the kind of workshops you do? Yeah, or? I try I try and find the strike a balance i think i need to push myself further i've turned into a bit of a home home bird i'm not gonna, I'm not gonna deny i do like working from home i like being at home i've got the gym in the garage i like going for a run i've just moved house it's a nice house and the client is most of them are down south and i've moved back up north so there is that element but i think it is you can't you can't be getting around the whiteboard physically and i know people you know, people take the piss out of having post-its and stuff. Yeah. But sometimes you just need to draw it out, right? And I don't think, given the right warm-up, what does wind me up is driving hundreds of miles to sit on Skype calls. Yeah, yeah, if yeah. it's done with purpose, if it's done with intent, and it's well-organized, brilliant. Where I struggle is driving somewhere and then sitting on Skype oh, calls all day. I mean, it's the darkest part i think of this kind of halfway house or almost in the minute where not everybody's on site all the time and i'm not advocating that should be the case no, in the no, no. Way, boys and girls just needs to be well organized like you say there's you turn up to client site and you stick on your headphones and you sit on your skype and you think you know maybe other than catching someone over the water cooler or for a coffee th there's no ad value in yeah, that yeah. in fact it's, it's not added value because guess what someone's paid me to be somewhere yeah yeah and it's like not not cheap like there's no yeah there's no getting away from that the rates are what they are so users, like yeah. if you're going to, if you're going to, if you're going to dict, not dictate, if you're going to advocate for us to come on site and you've got outside help, then let's get, get your bang for your buck, buck folks. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Agree, don't, don't agree. make us just sit there. Um, you're writing a book or you've wrote, I'm right, wrote well, the book's finished. The uh, book's finished. It's still doing some stuff. I, I need to have a talk with some people and maybe this is something me and you will talk about a, a wee bit later about maybe some forward activity or something like that. So it's, it's definitely in the kind of spit and polish up. Uh, have you got the name yet? I saw that, something on yeah, LinkedIn. This yeah, is one of the times yeah. where I didn't know if you were joking no, or not. No, uh, seriously. It's everything you know about Agile is wrong, Yeah, uh, which I know is suitably weighted and controversial, but I can probably counter that slightly with the subtitle of the book, which is, and, and so am I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's based on the, you know, you hear a lot of coaches. This is something me and you explored a, a wee bit, I think, before we started talking on the on the podcast, Jack, in terms of, uh, you know, here's my favorite quote because nobody really understood it in terms of the pandemic. I oh, believe science. Okay, I'm more than willing. To recite the six scientific steps to me, please. And nobody could do it, but they yeah. all believed science. So that, that's an interesting thing behaviorally. And I think you see this in our industry all the time. Oh, well, we're scientists. We're hypothesis testers. Okay, great. Um, name me the three most important. Actually, tell you what, just name me one. What's the real most important uh, scientific print? They can't do it. It's like mm. falsification. What is falsification? Most people don't even know, Jack. Falsification is from a scientific point of view, you can never be right. You can only be wrong. Mm. Yeah? You can only disprove a hype. That's it. So it is very much based on this very kind of old school, I'm not going to call it empiricism because it's, I mean, it is all based on experience, but it's almost taken a lot of the stuff me and you have been speaking about today and kind of saying, you know, okay, organize, why do you want to do this, right? You're probably wrong about why, you probably do need to do it, by the way, mm. but you, you're wrong about all the reasons. 
team members, you know, there's a whole big bit about a lot of the teams that I've worked with in the past. You know, it's almost apologetic. You know, yeah. if, if you're sitting in a team on your own and you haven't been trained and you haven't been coached and you've got some poor guy or girl who's been badged as a strong master, and by the way, they don't know what they're doing either. Um, it was actually never supposed to be like this. Okay, you know, that was never the aim of this type of work ever. Yeah. So apologies to you lot. Uh, but here's why you're wrong, because that's not agile. You're, you've just been missold it. Mm. Um, whole bunch of other stuff in terms of, you know, even starting to challenge a lot of the more traditional roles. You see, you know, I, I don't want to come across as too safe or too scrum-based in this, but they're the most common, Jack. So I'm yeah, just going to keep using that. good reference points. You know, uh, product owners. You know, I don't just say that because of my background and I'm, yeah. I'm much more on the scrum track than the product track. And, and to be fair, Jack, I think at this point, nobody would buy a product that Dave Bishop defined. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> Apart from the book. <laughs> or, or myself. Yeah, that's, yeah. The, that's the useful thing. Uh, but, you know, the product owner role. I mean, ha, ha, here's a question for you. How often do you really see that done? I wouldn't even say well. I'd say done at all. I think, especially in large, large organizations there's a fundamental difference between a large organization product owner and a scrum product owner. And I, again, one of the things I always say to people is you're on a product owner course. Have you, can you, have you got decision-making authority? Do you hold the budget? Do you hold the vision? Oh no. And let's not, let's not deny most of the time. Oh, the BA does that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The BA does more of the scrum product owner role than the actual product owner. Cause the product owner in a large bank if they're a product owner of the application, they're somewhere in the ivory tower. Yeah, yeah, but, that, yeah. but yet you're calling product owners within development teams. And it's like, let's just, again, here, here's the difference. You you fill your boots and make up your own mind. But like you say, it's, it's so misunderstood in terms of the delegate authority, the ability to face off to stakeholders, uh, prioritization. I mean, you know, basic prior. I mean, I'm not even mm. talking about full WSJF or whatever else, Jack. You know, even just the what, what do we? I mean, how many times do you hear it? I hear it all the time. Oh, this looks like it's a backlog. This a wee bit out of control. I've always had a rule about backlogs. If I'm embarrassed to show it to somebody else, guess what? It's time for me and the team to start tidying up. Yeah, yeah old yeah. fashioned, old fashioned. And um, no, we just m must do all. It's like well, that, it's not really a backlog, then, is it? It's just a big long to do list. And actually, at that point, we may as well just stick that into Microsoft Project and work to that because yeah, there's yeah. no advantage to, if we actually have to do all of this. No point doing Scrum. Yeah, well, there, there can't be any scope adjustment at that point. What do you hope the book achieves, mate? Um, I, I mean, I think I'm well enough realistic with myself, Jack, to understand it's not going to mean a, a holiday home in the Caribbean and a, a mansion made out of champagne. But I, I just hope it makes, not just selfishly people like myself and your life a wee bit easier. Mm. I hope it makes life easier. You know, like I say, I hope it makes life easier for the C-suite. I hope it makes them right, make better decisions. I hope it makes it easier for people in the teams who this can be enforced. Here's the other thing, Jack. We don't enforce it. But if somebody's boss's boss's boss is enforcing it, there's nothing I can actually do to shield that team that much from it. Yeah, I can maybe spend some hard time with them getting some evidence and then present it in the back. But guess what? I can st I can still be marched off or killed for said conversation as, yeah, it, yeah. as it should be, by the way. So, you know, it's, I think it's that. It's about, you know, trying to make... I mean, what motivates you, Jack? There's the thing. What motivates me? Mm. I like to leave things in a little bit of a better state than I found them. Yeah doesn't sound incredibly ambitious does you know i i know at this point in my career and everything i'm not going to change the world i might build products that do yeah um but yeah that's it how can we make things a little bit better and without putting you on the spot too much when pre-christmas pre-christmas definitely yeah uh so the next point to that will be an audiobook i mean i'll maybe get someone with a nicer voice than mine maybe yourself to if i can afford your day rate you don't want this uh, weird welsh scouse <laughs> convoluted accent that's weird i think mine's from everywhere and because i've now spent that much time on and off living and working up with clients in scotland i'm starting i mean i am yeah, scottish there is a, there is a, to my a wedding so does it even, and it gets worse whenever I spend any time in After Scotland. A few does, does that happen to you in Wales? Do you get slightly more Welsh when you? Not go? really, because I don't think I've got a Welsh accent. It gets more the more I spend in the the, the Mersey side way. To be honest, um, where can people get hold of you, mate? Where like you on LinkedIn, LinkedIn Twitter? I mean, I am on Twitter, but not really. I mean, uh, so there's probably not a lot of point. LinkedIn, uh, Dave Bishop SPC. 
uh, Agile Coach or whatever it is on there. That, that's the main way. I've got my website, www.successthroughsafe.com. Controversial <laughs> name, uh, given our conversation earlier. But they're, they're really the main ways to to get in touch with me. You know, it's uh, I, I try and make myself as available. Obviously, Jack, me and you have got to prove to mm. HMRC and other interested parties we are actively marketing ourselves. So. Yeah. <laughs> if you're listening... <laughs> When's, where's the book going to be on Amazon or on the website? Yeah, we'll, we'll do it through both. But yeah, predominantly through Amazon. I think I've got a debate about iBooks because I don't know if okay. you've looked at that before, but their, their charging model is a bit too weird, okay. I think, to bother with it. So. All right, mate. Anything else on your mind before we let you go? No, Anything just, else to plug? It's just, no, it's been a real, real pleasure. Uh, you know, as always, this is the first time actually me and Jack have, have met face to face. So it's uh, it's really, really good oh, yeah. to... Sweaty am, mate. Yeah, mate, same <laughs> with me. It's, it's the problem in this this lovely, uh, <laughs> lovely uh, Warrington day. Uh, so just thanks. Thanks to everybody for listening. Uh, I hope that's been useful for, for people. I hope it's been interesting. Um, and I wish you every success with this, buddy, yeah, and everything else same, that you mate. do. Appreciate it. I think the reason I asked you to come on, it's like you said before, we're not we're not always going to agree, but it's it's been able to disagree agreeably. I don't think we disagree on that much, to be I fair. Think we but agree on more than we yeah, disagree. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. But I think that's there's no point in me getting a load of people who I agree with, right? <laughs> because that's just, you know it's good for my ego, but not good for the cognitive diversity. But um, appreciate it, mate. Thank you very much. Thanks, buddy. Cheers, Jack.